right. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Eat, Play, Love campaign kickoff event. We're so thrilled that you're, you've joined us today uh, from your homes and perhaps your kitchens for our very first online SCCOE cooking event. So because we are going to be filming today's um, event, we ask that you please continue to mute yourself um, and then please turn off your camera. That allows for Laura's three cameras to be in full view for all the participants. And then if you have any questions along the way, um, we want you to ask them. So there's a chat box at the bottom that you're welcome to put all your questions into. And then along the way, I'll go ahead and read them and share them with Laura. So this evening, uh, we're taking a fun and playful approach to a healthy eating with Laura Steck Who's, our, who's the owner of Innovative Cuisine. Uh, Laura is the author, educator, and professional chef. Her work has been featured on NPR, Martha Stewart, LA Times, Wall Street Journal, Scientific American, and numerous local and national media sites. She is a private and corporate chef and a culinary health educator for Kaiser Permanente and many Bay Area corporate wellness programs. Today, you'll have the opportunity to witness Laura's passion for food, as well as the planet and how we are all connected to this earth through food. So with that, let's get started and welcome Laura. Oh, thank you. Shanley, that was beautiful. Gave me chills. Hi, everybody. Santa Clara County Office of Education. I'm going to get in the right light here. It's great to have you today in my kitchen in Portola Valley. Uh, welcome to Kitchen TV. We like to stir things up. And for the next hour, happy to present to you uh... unmute. Okay. <laughs> hi again. Uh, hi, Santa Clara County, Office of Education, Chef Laura Steck in the house, broadcasting Kitchen TV from Portola Valley, where we like to stir things up. Uh, today, we have a class for you on Plant Forward 2021. And Plant Forward is actually better than plant-based. It's more of a trendy term, or at least not maybe not as trendy as plant-based. What Plant Forward means is that you can still have meat in your diet if you choose. But no matter where you are or what age you are, all of us need to be eating more plants because it's with plants that we're going to avoid many of the comorbidities that are showing up because we're, we have a metabolic syndrome or issues with the way that our body digests food. A lot of the foods that we eat don't digest that well, leading us to uh, metabolic syndrome, things like bad uh, blood sugar, bad blood pressure, uh, obesity, and weight gain. And when we start incorporating plants into our diet, we can actually make a shift of the sluggishness of our body in a relatively short amount of time. So the more plants you can add to your body, the better. And that's what this class is about today. Um, a couple things. Uh, I, if, if you have questions during cooking, as Shami said, put them in the chat box. We'll try to answer them. I think I'm hearing people are cooking along with us. So we're going to start cooking and then take a little break and talk a little bit so that people can catch up and then we'll finish cooking. Um, when I say plant forward, what I mean is that plants are uh, meat is not my enemy, but meat is not my muse. And one of the reasons why we wanna think about more plants is that they give us so much more creativity than meat does. And that's what we're gonna learn about today. And if you have um, any allergies or if you have uh, certain foods you don't eat, that's a perfect question to ask. What's a substitute for something that um, uh, I may be cooking? We like your feedback at the end of class. So that's fantastic. You have my contact information in the packet. And I wanna say this is the first of three classes we'll be doing. Uh, the next one will be Latin American. I don't have the date on that, maybe Shami does. And then we'll also be doing De-Stress Fest. So that's gonna be fun. Um, for anyone who was in class in 2019, we did, we actually did plant forward, um, but we'll have a different menu this time. And also I have taught quick cooking uh, with the Santa Clara County Office of Education. 
Okay. So today is going to be some familiar recipes that we give a new focus to because often when we're learning new things, we do best by having some establishment to things. So we'll be doing a risotto, but with a whole grain. We're going to be doing some tempeh if you chose to buy tempeh today, which is a soy protein that uh, maybe you haven't used and it might be your brand new protein. And then we're gonna look at new techniques and systems that bring some of the ideas and recipes that we've been doing in our lives into more focus, into clarity, and looking a little bit at the science of it. As we make our risotto, our tempeh, we're going to do a broccolini that's not in your recipe packet. And then we'll be doing two crema of choice. And plus we'll be doing a crunch. And these, these ways to season plant foods are important because one of the things we need to learn when we're starting to introduce more plants is why we like meat. We want to learn why we like meat. And one of the reasons we like meat is because meat comes with its own seasoning. Meats have nitrogen. Nitrogen on our tongue is more complex than carbohydrates found in vegetables. So our job as cooks is to learn how to bring out the secrets of vegetables, bring out the secrets and add seasonings to plants because they need a little bit more than the ease of nitrogen and meat. And uh, we'll do that today during class. All right. So again, only 12%, they say, of the United States is metabolically healthy. That means that we have normal cholesterol, normal glucose levels, no hypertension, and a healthy weight circumference. So when we add more plants, we're gonna to move toward um, more friendly metabolism and one that cooperates better with our bodies. And that's what we're looking for. Now, how much do we need? Well, everybody's different, but about one and a half to two cups of fruit a day is good, is a good goal. Two to three cups of vegetables a day and about three cups of grain make 75% of that whole grain if you can. And um, if you started dinner, it's too late. So today we're gonna do a couple quickies also that talk about how to bring bre um, breakfast into um, more plants and vegetables as well. All right, so the first thing we're gonna start off is the risotto. It takes the longest to cook. And we're going to be making our risotto today if you chose to buy it with farro. I can take the overhead shot. Farro or spelt is a whole grain. It is a cousin of wheat. Uh, farro, I want to show you different kinds of wheat because farro and spelt are similar. Uh, in fact, they're the same grain, depending on if you come from Italy or if you come from the United States, we usually call it spelt in the United States, farro in Italy. But look at that grain as compared to a more older type of grain, which is called emmer, which is the grandfather of wheat. And it's much tighter, as you can see. So what we get from these more um, hybridized brands of wheat is a little bit more of a, uh, a less chewy and a little bit more of a, you know, a cakey, a flaky. And I also want to show you um, regular wheat berries. And we can see the difference. This is the oldest. See how it's the tightest? That turned into this, which is what we use a lot for bread. And then farro is what they call a bastardized cousin of it, but still a whole grain. Um, if you chose not to use the whole grains uh, or farro, you can definitely use um, arborio rice, which is the classic risotto, but it is a refined rice. And so now we're looking for a whole grain. Okay, why don't we start with our onion and get your whole onion out. And I want you to, if you have any of the, uh, these stickers, you can take them off. And these do not compost. So until one of your very smart children figure out how to make a biocompostable sticker, we have to take these off because they're messing up the compost piles in our municipal systems and in our backyards. So just put those in the trash. Now I'll take the overhead shot, please. And I'm going to cut the onion on the top and the bottom, and then cut it in half. And this is the way to dice an onion. And you'll never forget me after this. 
So the problem with dicing onions is we happen to use them, we touch them too much, the acids and the onions fly up in the, uh, in the air, they land in our eyes, and then I can't cut because I'm crying. So we want to touch the onion as little as possible. One way to do that is with a sharp knife. I think back in 2019, we talked about knife skills. We won't have time today, but definitely a sharp knife is important. And the other thing is just don't handle it that much. Have a system for the way you chop your onion. All right, once you've got the skin off, um, we're gonna take our knife and cut into, we're gonna take the part of the onion that's connected to the plant and put that in back and then take our knife and cut into the onion horizontally. Now, not all the way, about three quarters of the way through, and that leaves something to keep the onion together and back. And I'm gonna to continue to put slices into this onion horizontally, and I put as many as I want, remembering that the more the slice, the smaller the dice. Take my knife the opposite way, and now I'm going to cut down, what, vertically, not all the way through, about three quarters of the way through, remembering that the more the slice, the smaller the dice. I'm left with a checkerboard. And now all I have to do is cut straight down, choosing the size, and I'm using a smaller dice here for our risotto. And when you get to the part that you didn't cut through, that guy folds down, and then you just cut those guys into julienne or sticks. I'm cutting around that little knobby that I'll put in my soup pot for later, and then I can dice those guys up. So let's try that again with the other half of your onion. We'll take the onion and cut it horizontally. I'm putting about four slices in on mine, and then vertically. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 is what I was doing. Cutting down. Where it's not been cut, flip it down, cut that into what they call planks or sticks, cut out the stem and, so, and dice those guys up. All right. You're gonna take a not non-stick skillet, something hopefully that you can do some caramelization in. We'll talk about that more. One that you can have a cover to. I have it like all clad and I'm happy to answer questions about cookware. And turn on your stove to about medium high and take out your extra virgin olive oil with a smoke point of 375 to 425. Extra virgin olive oil is fine to saute with. The average temperature of a pan saute is about 365 to 375 on the stove. You don't want to use fancy olive oil that you pay a lot of money for, nor very flavorful oil, because basically what you'll do with those more expensive olive oils is saute your flavor into the air and your money too. So a standard regular, you know, Trader Joe's organic olive oil is absolutely fine to saute with. And to that, um, why don't we, yeah, give us a perfect chamois. We're gonna add a little bit of a tablespoon or two of oil to the pan. Now, when I'm moving my onions from my board to the pan, do I use the front of my knife? Or do I use the back of my knife? Is it this way with my knife or this way with my knife? Which way do I use my knife when I'm transferring things from the board to the stove? Use the back of the knife. Why do I use the back of the knife and not the front of the knife? I'll let you think about that for a second. Okay, we'll take the stove shot. Yeah, we're going to stir that up. If you look like you might need a little bit more oil, you're absolutely fine to use it. Um, I'm going to say something that you might fall over, but we don't eat enough extra virgin olive oil in this country. In the United States, we eat two tablespoons a week. In France, no, in Italy, they eat a cup. 
And in Greece, they eat two cups of olive oil a week. All right. We're going to mix that guy up. And we're going to go on to our grain. Now, again, we got some farro here or some wheat. I didn't wash it because I want that extra starch not to drain down the sink. Um, I've got a cup and a half here. And again, you can use pretty much any grain. The idea is that if we, um, if we mix, if we give it its time and cook it in a flatter pan, we can come closer to the starch that is emitted from our boreal rice. And what we're lacking is all that extra starch that arboreal rice shines on. But at the back end, we're going to make it creamy by adding some of our creme of choice. All right, let that go a little bit. And then we're going to start um, marinating our tempeh. So I'll take the overhead shot, please. Um, tempeh is a, is a soy product. Uh, it is a not processed as much as tofu. And it has, um, it is made from, um, it's a fermented food actually. So not only do you get some soy, you get um, some uh, good fermentation that helps to digest some of the issues with soy. And I'm happy to talk about some of those old things like we're not supposed to eat soy because actually it was a marketing campaign that I'm happy to talk about. But um, tempeh is an interesting product. You may have never used it before. It has more uh, chunks. It's not all puree. And when you take it out of the package, you might have a little bit of brown, black stuff on it, but that's okay too. If you don't like the way the black stuff looks, you can always just kind of trim it off. It actually comes off pretty quickly, but there's nothing wrong with the black on, a, on, on the tempeh. And with my tempeh, I'm just gonna cut it any way I choose. I might wanna cut it in fingers because that's a nice way to give portions to people. But for marinating and for sauteing, I find it easier to just cut it into quarters. And that's what I'm going to do with this. Now let's go back to the stove. Okay, we've got some good um, caramelization happening here. This brown stuff on the bottom of the pan is not stuff you want to throw away. That caramelization is the culinary gold or the dehydrated essence of what you're cooking. That's where your flavor has dehydrated into gold. So instead of letting it get too dark when it becomes black, blackened or burnt, we want to continue to let it develop, but then deglaze our pan to pick it up and to put it into our food. And we can deglaze with wine, we can deglaze with stock, and I'm just going to add a little bit in there. Laura, we have a question. Please. So um, Trish is asking if she could replace firm uh, the tempeh with firm tofu. Sure, yeah. Replace it with firm tofu. I'm going to add in the the, um, the farro now and mix it in with my with my onion and give it a good mix. Usually, what you want to do, you want about a medium heat right now, and you want that heat to start toasting the grains because. Toasted gray, why would you toast a grain? Well, why do you toast toast, right? For flavor. So let some of that toasting happen. And if you have not, I want you to turn on about four cups of stock in the back. And we didn't do that, so we'll do that first. And I'm just gonna turn off my tempeh or my, um, my, um, Emma right now, my, my faro right now, while that stock heats up and go back to making our marinade for our tempeh. So the marinade for the tempeh is very simple. From it, we will make a sauce at the end, a very fast sauce. 
And uh, we're going to use some vegetable stock, which we have back here, uh, heating up. I'm gonna grab about a quarter cup of it. It wasn't say half cup of it, quarter cup of it. I don't know where my quarter cup is. Let me just grab something. I'm gonna grab about a quarter cup of stock. I'll take the overhead shot. I'm gonna grab about a quarter cup of wine. If you don't like wine, you could use, um, you can use more stock. You could use apple juice. You could just eliminate it in general. You could use a little lemon juice, but not as much as wine because it's stronger. I'm gonna add two tablespoons or so of soy sauce. Now soy sauce is not all equal. I happen to have here a Sanjay soy sauce. It is gluten-free and I think it's low sodium. Um, soy sauce can be made in 24 hours. That's how Kikamon is made. Or you can actually ferment it for over a year. Like we used to do at the macrobiotic school when I was in my 30s, I went to a macrobiotic school and we made soy sauce. The more you pay for soy sauce, usually the better quality you will get. So don't always reach for the cheaper soy sauce because the umami, and we'll talk about that in a second, that you get from a more complex, longer fermented soy sauce is what you are going for in your plant forward cooking. And then I'm gonna add some mustard, about a teaspoon, mustard of choice. So when you're making these kinds of sauces, it's a great time to use mustards. You know, you might have like, in my kitchen, I've got like four mustards in the refrigerator, right? You don't always have to use Dijon, right? Use up what you have. Food wants to be used, not stored in your refrigerator for, for years. So whatever mustard you have, that's what you want to use. And I'm going to mix that guy up. Right, and that's our easy quick marinade that I'll just put into something flat. Now you may have already marinated your tempeh. I think I told you to do that because class sometimes goes too, there's too much going on. But if you didn't, you'll be able to catch up because we'll do a little talking. And when you marinate something, you can do a couple things. You can move the marinade around like this to coat both the front and the back. Or once you put it down, just flip it, right? Either way. And we'll let that marinate till the end of class. All right, back to the over, uh, back to the stove shot, please. I've got my stock. Now the difference between this application and an application of risotto is we're going to add the majority of the stock in. Because the reason why you add um, a partial stock, like a half a cup at a time with risotto, is you want the starch to release. So here we're not dealing with as much starch as we would with our boreal rice, but nonetheless, uh, we're gonna add most of the stock, about three and a half cups is what I usually add. I know the recipe says add it all, but I like to reserve a little bit so that you have a flexibility and uh, to be able to you know, add more later. And then I'm just gonna add some salt to that. And then we'll cover that baby up. And we're gonna let that cook to basically the end of class. Okay. All right, let's clean up the cutting board. One of my teachers used to say that the vegetables like their due. They don't wanna share the cutting board with other things. So make sure that you keep your cutting board clean out of respect to your vegetables. <coughs> All right, now I'm gonna do two quickies, two little quickies for you. Let's get them out, they're in your packet. You're not making them because what you can do now is you can um, catch up or just watch me do a few things. So um, as I said earlier, if you start your vegetables, uh, eating your vegetables at dinner time, you're not gonna be able to eat as much as you need to, right? About three cups of vegetables a day at least it'd be better to have four. And um, 
One way we can do that is a breakfast. So let's give, let me give you a few ideas of the way that I do it. And we're gonna start off with a bagel. So I'm a fan of bagels and I like to eat them, not every morning for breakfast, but I'm just checking my risotto. So if you see on the, oh, on the stove shot, the risotto is boiling. So I am gonna just turn it down a little bit, make sure that cover is on, and then we'll just let it cook slowly. Okay, so I've got um, cream cheese, but for those of you who are not interested in cow's cream cheese, I actually have a dairy-free cream cheese. You can see the overhead shot on um, the company called um, Follow Your Heart. And uh, it's just a lovely cream cheese that works really well. Any cream cheese will do. I may toast my bagel, I may not, but I'll just spread my cream cheese on it. And this is something that I used to buy from Los Bagels in Arcata, California, if anyone has ever been there. And uh, it's just a fantastic way to get a few more vegetables in your diet. So toasted bagel, non-toasted bagel, doesn't matter. All I'll do is I'll top it with a little bit of grated carrot. And then I'll top it with some black olives that are chopped. And then actually I'm gonna introduce something to you that you may have never heard of before. It's called gomasio, gomasio. It's sesame seeds and sea salt. You can add it to grains is what the macrobiotics will do. When you start incorporating more grains, grains need flavor. And actually gomasio is one of the ways that the Japanese or macrobiotics will sprinkle on top of your grain. Now here, it is just sesame seeds and sea salt. You can make it. We're not gonna to learn to make it today, but you can also buy it from, um, uh, you can buy it from Whole Foods and it's in the Asian section and it just adds a little bit of fat, good B vitamins from the sesame seeds as well as salt. And of course, not necessary, but a beautiful vegetable bagel. And then also I'm going to make some overnight oats. I was just on a camp trip. I went down to Death Valley. This is what I was eating in the morning because not only can you use vegetables in this recipe, you can save yourself a lot of time in the morning. Because if you're one of those people that likes oats but can't stand cleaning the pot because all the oats stick to it, you may find you like this recipe better. Just put oats, you've got a recipe, but I, you know, half a quarter cup, half a cup, how much do you eat? I like to use a glass container like this because um, that means if I really want hot cereal, I can pop this in the microwave in the morning. And then I just add some nuts and fruit, right? Dried nuts and fruit, whatever I happen to have. I add, I usually add some um, powdered, either peanut butter or almond butter. You could use redder, regular almond butter, peanut butter, or if you have a, an allergy, sesame butter. But I find as someone who's not eating a lot of meat, I do eat a lot of um, nut butters and seed butters. And if you have allergies, you may consider seed butters or even the new butter, which is out there called a chickpea butter, which is actually a fascinating um, substitute for peanut butter. And of course, these are high in protein. I also sprinkle on flax, I sprinkle on hemp. Interestingly enough, hemp is extremely high in protein. A half cup of hemp seeds, just uh, out of the package, not toasted, is almost equal to beef, believe it or not. And then milk of choice. It could be cow's milk, I'm, I'm a soy person, it could be almond milk. And do this the night before or give yourself at least an hour before breakfast. And then you don't even have to mix it. You can just cover it up, put it in the refrigerator. Oh, no, I wanna add the vegetables to it though. So the vegetables that you can add to it. One, you might add some grated zucchini, zucchini bread, right? It fits in very well to these types of things. Or you may add some cauliflower rice to your oatmeal. I don't know if I'd add both, because then it's being more vegetable-y, but there's no reason why you can't have vegetables for breakfast. 
And with the cauliflower rice or the grated zucchini, it makes a nice addition to your oatmeal. No one will know it's there, uh, at least the, the cauliflower rice, because it's white, the kids won't know. The green, okay, don't add this grated zucchini. Um, and then cover it up and again, store it in the refrigerator overnight and you will have um, a delicious cereal in the morning that can be served cold, can be walked out to go when we go back to work again and when we leave to go to work again, or you can just um, eat it cold. And uh, it's absolutely fantastic. I, I, I don't cook oatmeal anymore. I love oatmeal, but I couldn't stand cleaning the pan. So this is the way to go. All right. Oh, let me uh, I'm gonna just put a few blueberries in because I have it here. And then we'll clean up the board. Okay. So we've got our tempeh, tempeh marinating. We're going to check our um, risotto. Our risotto with the overhead stop, uh, overhead shot looks a little, um, uh, well, it was, I just moved the pan. I was going to say it's boiling a little bit heavy, but it's okay now. And um, we'll just let that go and be good with that. Okay. Now, the other thing that you have on your recipe is a lunch bowl. We're not going to get into that today. But the lunch bowl, the idea that we combine all the ingredients that you have on your recipe into the lunch bowl, um, teaches us something very important when we start eating more plants. And that is variation causes us to eat more. Variation causes us to eat more. That's so important. I'm going to turn around and say it again. Variation causes us to eat more. The junk food industry knows this. That's why there are 10 flavors of Doritos. I eat the nacho cheese and I really love those, but then Cool Ranch is right there. So I eat those and hey, it's not nacho cheese. So I eat more of those and then I eat nacho cheese and you know, right? Variation causes us to eat more. And what the lunch bowl teaches us is that we get variation in a lot of different ways. We get variation by what we're cooking. So when it comes to plants, you know, a carrot is not an avocado, is not a cauliflower, is not a kale. So that's varied in the first right. But we also get variation in our cooking and eating by the way that we season it, we know that. Also by the way we cut it. Do I cut it big? Do I cut it small? These things make a difference. And as eaters, we want to play around with giving people new cuts and new shapes and new sizes because it's a fun thing to do and it intrigues our brain. Basically, eating, if you want to know how to be successful with eating, you want to turn yourself on to a lot of different flavors, textures, and colors because you're just feeding your brain and you want your brain to go, wow, 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 wow. And that's how you find that you get more satisfaction out of your diet is by variation. And so we can vary by what we eat, how we cut it, how we season it, and then also how we cook it or don't cook it. So in the case of a bowl, you might have raw vegetables, but you might have some grilled vegetables too. They're going to you're gonna take them in very differently. You might have some fermented vegetables, which are very different than raw and very different than cooked. So play around with the idea that variation causes you to eat more because that will help you to move more into a plant forward world. All right. Laura, okay. we have one question yeah. regarding the recording. Um, is it okay to share this video with, with our participants after today's show? Oh, sure, yeah, sure. We're going to get a video, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Now, one of the things I wanted to show you, I'll take the overhead shot, is just protein in a calf cup. And um, what you can see here, as I was saying, if we, if we use beef as the understanding that beef has 30 grams in a half cup, Look at hemp seeds, 29 grams. Now a half cup of hemp seeds is a lot, I agree with you. But if you're looking at protein stars, we look at combining things and what is really strong in protein. So I'm a nut butter person because I don't eat a lot of meat, very little. So peanut butter and nut butters are good for me, high in protein. Seitan, which we're not using today, is almost as high as chicken. Oh, it's higher than chicken actually. 
So, you know, tofu comes in a little bit lower. Of course, beef and peanuts are two of the highest things as well as hemp. So, and, and you know, of course, fish down here fitting in the same way as about seitan does. So there are a lot of different ways to get protein and we want to encourage you to start looking at and, and just do a little research, to, you know, find out how much protein is in a cup of black beans. And you might find that you can get more pro if you have issues with protein, you can get more than you are, um, than you were, you know, a lot of people, protein is the one issue that people have problems with, or they think they do. We are a, comp we are a country that eats way too much protein, but um, there are many ways you can get protein from plant sources. All right. Now we're going to make two sauces because variation causes us to eat more. And we're making a risotto that we could, what we would normally do is add Parmesan at the end, makes it creamy, but maybe you don't have Parmesan. So you can try some of the other options that we have on your menu. You can add cream cheese and make it creamy instead of Parmesan. And it doesn't have to be cream cheese from animals. Why do I want creamy? Well, you've got the crunchy of the grain and the farro is a crunchy grain. But Americans like variation again. So crunchy with creamy, all of a sudden my brain's going crunchy, creamy, crunchy, creamy. And you're like, yeah, you know, it's doing this thing. It's like putting a ping pong ball in your head and just turning your brain on to new flavors and textures. So we're gonna try two other ways we can make creamy as well today that are just fun and different and are um, something may maybe you never even considered. And the first one is working with a pressure cooker or an Instapot, or you can steam. But the thing about a pressure cooker or an Instapot, if you have either, and again, if you don't, that's fine. You, it's not, this, is, this isn't such an important part of the dish, but it's an interesting way of thinking of creamy, a very important addition in our diet. Um, pressure cookers and Instapots will break the fibers down of vegetables more than you would get in a steam or a saute. Why? because of the pressure, right? So I've got a small pressure cooker. It's like 20 years old, 30 years old. It's gotten older than that, it's 30 years old. And um, it's, from, it's, it's from Italy. So the big pressure cookers sometimes, they're so big, we, don't, we never cook that much food, especially if we're living alone or with one other person. So if you like, I don't have an Instapot myself because I've used pressure cookers from the macrobiotic days for years. But if you like the concept, but you don't want that big thing sitting on your counter, look for smaller pressure cookers. I don't think there are smaller Instapots um, from Italy. And what I'm gonna do with this is take some carrot and parsnip. Now carrot and parsnip, of course, we're moving into a new season now uh, of vegetables. We're moving into the spring of vegetables. But what I want is creamy. And you will, if, you, if you're someone who doesn't cook parsnip very much, right, parsnip, parsnip is one of the creamiest things you can eat, actually. It is fantastic for um, a, a dish like this. So I'm just going to peel, you know, I washed it and I peeled off the skin. And the same with my carrot. And then I'm just going to coarsely chop these guys. It doesn't matter how I'm chopping them into my pressure cooker. I'm going to make them approximately the same size. Why? Well, once so they cook, because it's going to be a fast pressure cook, and I want them relatively small. And the same thing goes with my parsnip about the same size so they cook at the same approximate rate that's why you do same size now oh, I see I've got a little bit of a something here so I'm just going to cut that out right if something doesn't look all that good oh look at see it's even got it doesn't mean that it's bad to eat what it means is you might not eat that want to eat that little part so just cut it out 
right? I'm not perfect, you're not perfect. Don't ask your parsnips to be perfect either, right? And I think I say a pound, but I'm actually more like a half a pound here. So I'm gonna put it, so it's not a lot. And to this pot, I'm going to add about a tablespoon or two of apple juice. You can add water. I'm gonna add a tablespoon or two of, of something called mirin, which is a cooking wine from Japanese cooking. It is low, it has about 4% uh, alcohol. You could use regular wine or you could use more apple juice or you could use water. But the thing that you don't wanna do is add too much because in a pressure cooker, what we're trying to do is turn this creamy. And if I have too much liquid, it's gonna turn into soup. What's important if you do do this recipe is you know kind of how your pressure cooker plays because you're not adding a lot of pressure to or a lot of liquid to it, you can easily burn. So just if you like the idea of this recipe, you know, test it out to make sure you know that you're not gonna lose all your water and burn your um, whatever you put inside. And then I'll just close that up. So we'll put that back on the stove back here and I'm gonna turn that on. And we're going to look at our, we'll look at our um, risotto again. Looks like it's doing good. Now that pressure cooker is going to come up to pressure fast because there's not a lot of liquid in it. So it's only going to take a couple minutes. And while we're waiting for it to come up to pressure, I'm going to make my second creamy addition to add to my risotto. Again, you don't have to make this. Um, I would make it, I would do it because it's just fast and easy. You might find something uh, that you never ate before that you really like, which is what cooking classes are all about, right? Something new. So I'm going to introduce you to one of those seed butters and we got some tahini here. Tahini is peanut butter made from sesame seeds. So for people with allergies to nuts, tahini could be your option. And it's not sweet as the nut butters. So it has a more neutral um, addition to things. I'm sorry, here's my pressure cooker. I don't want to mess it. Um, so definitely, and high in protein. And uh, sesame seeds are great with B vitamins. And to that, as the recipe says, about a tablespoon of tahini, I'm going to add about a tablespoon of nutritional yeast. And I'll take the overhead shot to just show you what nutritional yeast is. If you don't remember from the 1960s, we used to add this as a butter substitute for uh, on our popcorn. And nutritional yeast is made, it's actually grown. It is not the brewer's yeast that comes off the top of the beer, but it is a grown and fermented yeast and it has a delicious smell. And it smells like butter to me. <laughs> And so equal parts, um, equal parts tahiti and nutritional least give you a little cheesy. Oh, thank you, thank you. Shammy, you're getting that overhead shot ready. See, I don't always got 16 things going on here. Give you a nice creamy. And if that's not, if it's a little too thick for you, like this one looks like to add it to a risotto. Now again, the heat of the risotto will melt this, so I don't really need to dilute it. But for any reason, I thought it was too thick, I would add a little water. And then we'll just taste that to, you gotta, yeah, it's such an interesting combination. It's something that you would never, oh, I thought one, some, one tablespoon to one, two, I don't know what that was. One tablespoon, do it to taste. If, I would say one part tahini, one part, um, nutritional yeast, but you decide. You may like the tahini flavor more than the yeast. You might like them both the same, but the thing is it gives us like a cheesy vegan substitute. But remember, if that all is too crazy for you, just add Parmesan cheese. All right, so we're gonna bring up our pressure. Let me see if I can give you the camera. Can you see it? Okay, you can see this little knob whoops, right here. And it's pressure if it's hard. So it's good and it's gonna take about five minutes. I'm gonna put five minutes down on the, uh, on the, uh, 
No, no. Hey, Siri, set the timer for five minutes. And we're going to let that, Down. we're going to let that, um, those carrots and those parsnips get nice and soft and let the pressure smash or mess down the fibers, break down the fibers. Okay. Now we'll keep on that, um, that stove shot. So I'm going to do the tempeh next. And the tempeh we're going to do back here. I'm going to saute the tempeh up to give me a crunchy, crispy experience. And because I'm going to turn that temperature up on high, using a cast iron skillet, which was a perfect thing to sear meats and proteins. I'm going to use a higher heat oil, like avocado oil, sesame oil, um, uh, peanut oil is a higher heat. Why is a why is a cast iron skillet good for searing? It is good for searing because it holds heat. And often for something that you want, like a pancake or a fritter, that you want to have a, a, a brown side to it, the cast iron will allow you to get a, a nice browning of it because the cast iron is so heavy, it holds heat and allows that kind of continual um, browning to happen evenly. I've got my tempeh. And you can let it go overnight if you want. So you don't need to use it in a half an hour. You can go overnight. And we'll put that down in there. And then let's look at this guy too. Now I, getting loud in here, so I'm going to talk this way. I, oh, and leave it on, you don't need to look at me as close. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I just wanted to make sure that you could hear over the searing, the pressure cooking, which is happening, and the sauteing. Um, the, the risotto, we're coming to the end. We've got six minutes. It's probably going to need more time, but let's taste it and see. Let's give it a stir. It's actually doing our, let's see, let me get a wooden spoon. My favorite wooden spoons. Hello. How are you? Let's give it a stir. Now, our, it's been cooking about 25 minutes. We started a little late. We, I think we're going to go five minutes over because we started five minutes late. But actually, it's pretty close. So it's pretty close. It's got good flavor. Um, if we look at the texture, we still have a lot of moisture. We didn't add all the, I did not add all of the stock. But I like the texture actually, it's doing pretty good. So what I want to do is turn that heat up. So that I can start getting rid of and take the lid off so I can get rid of more of the moisture. And I think we're going to be good at that time. All right. So let's check our tempeh. Okay, so we're starting to get some good browning. Can you see that? Let's see. Let me get up. Hold on. We'll do this. I'm starting to get some good browning on the tempeh. Tempeh you could eat raw if you wanted to, but it doesn't have a lot of flavor. It has more flavor than tofu. It's nuttier. But tempeh like tofu will take on the flavor of whatever you put on it. 
So the marinade, huh, it's so hard to, it's so it's not, there we go. Good grounding. So that's good. Let that go. Oh, hey Siri, turn off. Okay, I'm going to turn off my pressure cooker. All right, still got that tab up. But I'm going to take it over to the sink to bring that temperature down. Hold on. Whoa. I think we got a little. All right. Okay, so we can see when Laura's doing all these things at once, we get to see a little bit of the result. Why don't we do the overhead shot? So you'll see that I, I, I got a little bit of brown in there, maybe a little bit more than I wanted, but um, I'm actually fine because we're running out of time and I did it beforehand just so that I wouldn't run out of time. So I actually have, from before you came to class, I have this same mixture, which of course is very soft. It's very, let me just take some of this out. You'll see how soft, it's like, it's like mashed potatoes, right? And so then just take it out and smash it. And you'll notice what I had when I didn't, when I wasn't doing 16 things at once. This is how much liquid I had left in the pressure cooker when the first time I cooked it. So I, I only used up about, I got still at least a tablespoon in here. So if you choose to do this, you need to be careful and know how long things take and make sure you're not teaching a cooking class doing it because it could be very easy. So this is fine. Actually, this is, you know, the part of this that's burnt would be that stuff right on the ends there. But this stuff here, this is the culinary gold. So this, is you want to use this, right? It's only the black stuff. It's all of this. I would deglaze that. It's only the stuff that really sticks to the pan that would not add that intensity of flavor that you're looking for. So I've got my creamy uh, vegetable or my creamy uh, root vegetables. I have my creamy nutritional yeast and, um, and uh, tahini. My risotto, if we get the, uh, if we get the back shot, the uh, oven shot, the stove shot, all good, it's coming along good. We can see, let's get this better. We don't have a lot of extra moisture now in that. It's actually, as you'll notice, you know, the moisture, the more moisture you have in, it'll fill in. So we've got a good texture here. And what I would love to do is do a few a different, Oh, the, the tempeh is good. I'm going to move this guy over here. I'm going to do, do we have, we do, we have a few, we have just a few more minutes. I'm actually going to do one last thing while you all catch up, which is the broccoli. Because in plant forward cuisine, vegetables have secrets and the secret of vegetables is vegetables are sweet. And our job as cooks is to bring that sweetness out. How do we do it? We do it in a number of different ways, but one way is through the process of caramelization. And any of you that were in class two years ago will know this. Vegetables have secrets, and the secret is that they're sweet. And sweetness comes out when we add heat to carbohydrates. You know, a raw onion is not sweet but a cooked onion is. Why? Because the heat on your stove got to 330 degrees Fahrenheit or 166-ish Celsius. And when carbohydrates reach 360, they become miraculous. They get sweet. So any vegetable can be sweet, not just onions, but you have to give it temperature of 330 degrees or higher. Where do I get that from? Stove, saute, onion, grill. Let's quickly saute up some broccolini so that we can make our point. All right. So something I just learned recently, if you think broccolini is too bitter, 
is that the bitter of the broccolini is in the leaves. So the more you touch those leaves or the, those florets, the more it will release the bitter. So if you don't want it bitter or you, if you're sensitive to that, keep your stems small, but don't cut your leaves. And that way your broccolini will have less of that bitterness. So to my saute pan, I'm just gonna add a little bit of moisture. I'll take the um, overhead shot. I'm just gonna add a few in there so we can saute some. And learn about caramelization while we finish up our risotto. All right, so I'm going to do a couple different risottos here. I'm good. We'll finish up in three minutes. I'm going to add some to this pan. I'm going to add some to this pan. To this pan, I will add my tahiti. To the other pan, we will add our vegetable mix. Remember, if none of those like, if you don't like any of those, you add in Parmesan cheese or some cream cheese. So that's a nice creamy mix. And remember, the heat will give you that creamy. And then here, maybe I added a little too much vegetable mix to that because it basically it does the same thing the tahini does. It mixes in almost as a cheese. Okay, so to finish up our broccoli, I'll take the uh, the, the oven shot or the, the stove shot. Just like with the risotto, when, when the vegetables cook, they get caramelized on the bottom of the pan. That caramelization, as we spoke of, is not something to wash down the sink, but to deglaze, to bring it up to your vegetable. So you wanna caramelize your vegetable with high heat, and then you wanna deglaze your pan and pick up all of that extra caramelization on the bottom of the pan. So you can caramelize, you can deglaze with wine or stock, but you can also deglaze with apple juice or olive juice or the beer you're drinking or the vodka soda or whatever. Just don't throw away that brown stuff on the pan. I'll take the overhead shot, take a flat wooden spoon and a little bit. I'll take the, I'll take, I mean, I'll take the, the stove shot. Oh, Laura, the camera, I think turned off for that one. Oh, I did. Oh gosh. Okay, here we go. We'll we'll take the take the overhead shot. We'll add this before it. Woo! So what that does is it finish it it removes that fond, that brown stuff, it's called fond, from the bottom of the pan and brings it up into your vegetable, making your vegetable even sweeter. So remember that vegetables have secrets and the secret is that they are sweet. And what we want to do is use that sweetness to get people to eat more vegetables. Okay, so I should have tasted this. I want to taste this guy first. I want to taste my. Mm -hmm. Tastes cheesy with the tahini, tastes cheesy. And then we've got the vegetable one that we'll put off on the side.
Now remember with presentation, the eye is attracted to heights. So don't make things flat, make, build things on top of each other, right? Height is sexy, flat is not. So when you are serving, you want to try to create heat or height, not heat, height. And let's see, I got my tempeh, I've got to find a cutting board so I can cut it up. I'm running out of cutting boards. And let me grab a knife. Here we go. Take, oh, and we shoot, we've got what we didn't have a time to do is make finish up our sauce for our tempeh. And so our sauce for the tempeh, you just take the marinade and you reduce it down and then you put some butter in it. It's very simple. Just take that marinade that your tempeh was in, reduce it down and put a little butter in it. And the butter will thicken it. Do you know why butter thickens a sauce? Because the fat molecules, this is so interesting, get in the way of the moisture moving. Isn't it crazy? And then last but not least, I do have my crunch. And of course, we don't have time to, I just, uh, to, um, I, I basically made it. I've got my nuts. I've got some green onions. I didn't have any cilantro. I've got some garlic and ginger. And then what, now why would I, why would I make a little crunch every now and again and have that around for my plant forward meals? It's because variation causes us to eat more. People like crunch. So if you can give someone a Gamasio or a Trader Joe's everyday seasoning or something like this peanut relish, people will like it. And that's how they're going to eat more of your food if they get that creamy and that crunchy together in the same meal. So with that, we've got our bagel. And we also have our overnight oats with some vegetables to it. And dear Santa Clara County Office of Education, if I had my sauce, I would just take my marinade again, uh, reduce it down half and then add some butter and I would just drizzle the sauce on, but I'm already, well, now I'm three minutes late because we started five minutes. So that is our beautiful, well, that looks pretty nice. Let's lift it up to you and show you. I'll take the overhead shot. I'll take any questions you have. And if not, I think I might have dinner. <laughs> Are there questions? Let's do this. Feel free to unmute yourself if you do have questions and, and you can ask Laura. Where can I get your spoon? <laughs> the smiley spoons? Yeah. You know, the smiley spoons are the best gift um, to give people. And I got them online. I think I got them on Amazon. So yeah, you should give me to your friends because nobody has them. Oh, they don't want one of us. Yes, they do. So yeah, get these. On. I, I love these. They always make me smile. So I, I got them on Amazon. I like them. Thank you. Perfect gift. I give it out of, I, that's what I give for gifts now is smiley spoons. <laughs> I was late, so I apologize if this has been asked, but is there a particular kind of tempeh? I mean, a brand or a kind that's better than others? Tempeh is something I'm not that familiar with. Yeah, so tempeh is, of course, is a different kind of food. Um, it's a, again, we saw that it's, it's maybe like a second tier protein, not up there with seitan, uh, fish, beef, and um, uh, peanut butter. Um, you can get different uh, types of tempeh, yes. You can get some that have wild rice in them, some that have herbs in them. So look for different kinds. You can buy it at Trader Joe's, interestingly enough. Uh, today I got that element in Portola Valley. I got it at the grocery store that I have on Roberts up here. Um, the best thing that I think, and I've never done it, and I've heard it's the best, is to make your own tempeh. And um, I think I'm going to try to do that. So if anybody is interested in tempeh, uh, send me an email if you think you might want to uh, make your own. It's a fermented food and it's fascinating. I, again, I, I eat very little meat and um, I'm doing pretty good. I, I just got done hiking a uh, lot of miles in Death Valley and bike riding. And for a 58 year old woman, I got a lot of strength and power. So I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not an athlete, but I definitely athletic. And 
I eat very little meat and I get plenty of protein. So um, tempeh is a new option. And again, you can marinate it in whatever. You can make it Italian, you know, marinate it in some garlic and sun-dried tomatoes and red wine, or if you don't want red wine because it'll turn it red, you can you know, use a white wine. Uh, you can make it Mexican by putting in maybe some, you know, mix some kind of dilute some hot sauce with some tequila and add uh, cumin and coriander. And then you've got, you know, Mexican mole tempeh. So like tofu, it's a sponge. Like mushrooms, it's a sponge. And again, the thing about vegetables is uh, meats and animal products have nitrogen. They're more complex on our tongue. Vegetables have carbohydrates. We need to bring out those carbohydrates, both with variation and then with techniques like caramelization, which will move us into um, 330 degrees Fahrenheit or higher, caramelize the vegetable, deglaze the pan. Don't throw away that brown fond on the bottom of the pan. And when you are trying to achieve caramelization, don't use a nonstick pan. That's where you want things to stick, right? You want that fond to come up. So not a nonstick pan, but a, a, a not nonstick pan. Anybody else? Santa Clara County of Office of Education has been a pleasure today to, um, to bring you into a little bit about Plant Forward 2021 as we all learn how to eat more vegetables, which not only benefits our own bodies, but the microbiome in our digestive system. That's a whole other class and a whole other topic. Um, but we want to make sure we eat enough might we want eat enough vegetables because not only does it benefit us, it benefits them. And if we're not feeding our microbiome, I, I don't even want to get into the problems. Uh, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. We're going to be doing Latin American. And I think it's it could be vegan or not vegan. So you'll have the option to do vegan Latin American, which I would have never done, except the, the almond milk company called Calafia. They asked me to do it vegan. So we, we, the class can be both. And until then, bon appetit. Thanks for coming.